And as you are seated, I pray that you will find a copy of Scripture right there in front of you. Page 1,233, 1233 is going to bring you to the last book in God's Word, Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4 is our primary and focus verse this morning. We're going to be in a few other portions of Scripture throughout the New Testament. I do have page numbers to help you at those points in time um, as we arrive there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And let's call upon the Lord to prepare us for His Word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your inspired, infallible, inerrant, written Word. Thank you that you love us and you tell us so. You love us so much that you tell us about your design, your plan, your will, your way, your very best design for our lives that brings you glory, that leads us to a knowledge of our salvation in Jesus Christ alone and reminds us that this world needs to know and experience and believe in the very same for themselves. May it be so by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning as you faithfully lead us once again. We say thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Some things are worth fighting for. Some things are worth fighting for. Some wars, some battles are necessary. Even to the point and even to the place where, where some men and some women willingly lay down their lives. They die fighting a certain battle, a certain war. They sacrifice to defend and to promote freedom. The type and the kind of freedom that we benefit from and that we enjoy every single day. Some battles are worth fighting. Memorial Day usually involves, for many of us, a parade. It may involve a picnic or some travel. It may involve a, a time of, of relaxation. But the point of Decoration Day, the point of Memorial Day, is singular in purpose. It is to recall, it is to remember those who willingly fought a necessary battle. And in the process, yes, they were killed. In the process, they laid down their lives. In the process, their lives were sacrificed for the blessing and the benefit of others. Some wars, some battles are worth fighting for. There's always been two flags that are a part of the sanctuary here at Fellowship Reformed Church. There is an American flag. There is the Christian flag. Two flags. Countless men and women have given their lives following the American flag into a battle. Resolute to fight for, resolute to defend the values that she promises to promote and what she stands for. But what can we say regarding the second flag? What can we say regarding the flag of the Christian church? Is her mission, are her values, is the freedom that she promotes, the freedom that she stands for, is, is it worth fighting for? Is it worth dying for? Are we willing to follow her into battle for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? This past week, Barner Research shared exactly how many people are willing to follow her, how many people are willing to follow Jesus into battle to, to reach the souls of those who are living apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How many folks are willing to fight for? How many folks are willing to battle for? How many folks will give everything God has given them to reach the souls and the lives of those who are perishing? Barna Research says 85% of Christian pastors 
Those who consider themselves to be active Christians, 45% of them will follow her. But when you consider everyone in America who who calls herself or himself a Christian, when when you look at the entire landscape of, of those who identify as believers in Jesus Christ, 25%. 25% are willing to fight the most important battle for the souls of those who are not only perishing from this world, but for the souls of those who are perishing for an eternity apart from the one true God. Maybe it's because we're scared. Maybe we're not willing to fight this battle. Maybe we're not willing to engage in this most important of wars because we're afraid of what might happen. God shares with us the fullness of what might happen for those who willingly and wholeheartedly serve. Do you want to know what might happen, church? Yes? Yes. Revelation 20, verse 4. You're there. Listen to the word of God. John the apostle is the one who was given this vision in his old age. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been, what? I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for or because of the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. Let's stop right there. If we are willing to fight this war, if we are willing to engage in this battle, right now one in four say they will. If we are willing to fight for the souls of those who do not yet know Jesus as Savior and Lord, it may ultimately cost us our physical lives. But church, let me ask you, can it cost you your forever life in Jesus Christ? Yes or no? And all God's people say, so I want to know this morning, what is the war? On this Memorial Day weekend, I I want to understand what is the most important war that that anyone will ever fight. And then I want to know how to win this war for the glory of my Father in heaven. You want to know how to win? Yes? Say amen. amen. All right, let's talk about the war. First of all, understand Christ, Jesus, has already won the war. Aren't you excited? Amen? Jesus has already won the war. How did he do that? He went all the way to the cross. He was was the Lamb of God. Jesus shed the fullness of his blood for the forgiveness of sins of all of those who so believe. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God against our sin. And so Jesus won the war against Satan, against sin, and against the power of the grave. However, we are still in war today. Because Satan has not yet been bound up and cast into the burning bowels of hell. There's coming a day when he will be. But right now, Satan is free in some ways. God has him on a leash, but Satan is still being a real nuisance in the lives of those who believe. And and Satan is trying to to lullaby folks onto his side of the battlefield. He does not want to see anybody believing in, confessing the name of, or following in a life of sanctification, Jesus Christ. Satan is trying to gather a side and a contingent for himself. He knows that he is going down and he wants others to go down with him. This is the war that we find ourselves in. Turn to page 1,151, 1151. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 3, it gives us a little, a little idea of, of what this war is. Little idea what this war is. 2 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 3. Paul is the one who's writing. And he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. That's what we're called to do. We are called to, to destroy strongholds. Because you see, Satan is, is the author of lies. He never brings an answer. He never brings truth. He never speaks reality. All he does is ask questions. All he does is, is tell lies. All he does is to introduce suspicion into our lives. He has people to, to be ignorant and to remain ignorantly following him. And people are given over to Satan's ideas. These are strongholds. People are, are following Satan's whims and, and, and Satan's ways. And, and that's what we're warring against. These are the lives that, that we are trying to reach. Look down there at verse 5. He continues. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive, uh, take every thought captive to, to obey Christ. You see, our war is to bring truth. Our war is to speak reality. Our war is to go where folks are, into every single arena. Wherever they are believing lies. And again, folks, what's the worst that could happen to us in this war on this side of heaven, according to Revelation 20, verse 4? What's the worst that could happen to us? What? We die. And yet in Jesus Christ, according to Pastor John Zweigheisen and the book of Revelation, we what? We, we win. Shortest, most well-remembered sermon ever. Thank you, Pastor Zweigheisen, right? The worst that can happen to us on this side of eternity as we are engaged in this battle and in this war is that it might cost us our physical lives. But John saw to eternity and in heaven were the souls of all of those who once had been beheaded. Does Father God lose any of his own church? Yes or no? No. And this is the war that we are called to fight. Okay, how are we going to win this war? How are we going to win this war as we go against Satan and as we're reaching the lives of those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? We are going to be, number two, witnesses. We're going to be witnesses. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to be next. Please. We're going to win this war by being witnesses. Now remember, as you're turning to Acts chapter 1, from Revelation 20, John says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus. Now, uh, where do you normally hear testimony at? Inside of a court room. Right. You have folks who are giving testimony. They are called what? The Witnesses. Witnesses are giving their testimony. Witnesses are telling their story. Witnesses are giving evidence to the facts. Witnesses are speaking from their experience and, and, and their point of view. The Greek word that, that's used here for witness is where we get our English derivative, martyr. Let me ask you this question. Does a martyr live? A martyr does what? He or she dies. There's that beheading part again. But a martyr is one who testifies. A martyr is one who tells the truth. A martyr is one who speaks the word of God. A martyr is one who is witnessing to the story of Jesus in his or her own life. And this is where our war begins. We have to begin witnessing. We have got to start testifying to the faithfulness of our God. As the world opens up its great, big, fat mouth and continues to speak lies, we have got to stand up and open our mouths and speak the truth of God thoughtfully, clearly, rightly, lovingly, at times directly out loud. Amen? Amen. 
That's what a witness does. We're not starting arguments. We're not bitter. We're not trying to be louder than, than the other side, those living apart from Jesus. We're witnesses. And this has always been God's design. That's why you're in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, what? There it is, witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see, this is how wars are won for Jesus. This is how the battle for a lost soul is won this is how somebody comes to know Christ as their, as their Savior and their Lord, the one they want to follow all the way to glory because somebody opened their mouth. Somebody dared to testify. Somebody dared to witness. Somebody dared to tell their story. Somebody dared to tell them the truth. How many folks here are ready to be a witness in the name and the power of Jesus Christ? How many here are ready to be a witness? You know what? If you're not ready to be a witness, you really have to ask yourself, what am I fighting for and defending and promoting in this world? Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, you will be my witnesses. You see, if I'm not a witness for Jesus, then what exactly am I testifying to with my life? Well, that clock's going really fast today. Whew, okay. Here, we're going to win this war by witnessing, testifying, telling the truth. We're going to win this war with, with the word of God. Say that with me, the Word of God. You know what? I need to know what God's word says, and so do you. We need to know what God's word means. We need to know why God's word matters. All of this is crucial. Because remember, lost people, people living apart from Jesus Christ, folks who, who still this morning are denying the, the authority of Jesus Christ, gripped in strongholds and the lies of Satan, they have their own truth. Did you know that? They have their own truth. They have things they believe. They have stuff they believe. They kind of have this, this structure in, in their lives that they, that, they, uh, that they hang on to. But they need to know the truth. Thy word is What? The answer is right there. Instead of telling people you're wrong, instead of telling people don't do that, and instead of telling people knock it off, you know what we need to do? We need to speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth unashamedly. We need to tell them the truth over and over again. We need to tell them why God is always right. And so we need to know what's in this book, what does it mean, and why does it matter? Paul calls Timothy to do that exact same thing. Here comes the page number, 1,183, 1183. Turn, 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 please. Thank you. 1183, that's going to be 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. For those of you who are joining us online, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 3, page 1183. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Say those three words with me. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Winning a war means we fight it with the word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word calls us to reprove. The word calls us to rebuke. With the word, we are to exhort. Reprove, 
means that we're willing to speak the truth into someone's life to show how they are not thinking clearly. Reprove. Show someone how they're not thinking clearly. They're not connecting all the dots the right way. And then rebuke. Re rebuke means you, you, you show somebody, this is how you're thinking the wrong way, and so this is how you're living the wrong way. And of course, when we live the wrong way, when we're living counter to the word of God, what is that called? It's a three-letter word that ends with in. Sin. Ah, oh, you're smart today. Yes. It, and so we, we reprove, showing them how they're thinking wrong. We, we rebuke, showing them then how they're living wrong and, and they're actively giving in to sin. And then we exhort. That, that means we go through scripture one word and one verse at a time. And we let them see how God, from Genesis to Revelation, how God is, is at work, how his design and his plan is, is unfolding, and how the promises and the prophecies and the faithfulness of God in the past are fulfilled in the person and, and, and the work and the, salvific, and the salvific reality of Jesus Christ and all that waits for us because the best part is yet to come for all of eternity in the glorious presence of God Almighty. Amen, church? Yes. And so we need to be in the word. We need to be people of the word and don't get weary and don't get tired and don't get bitter and don't get ornery and don't get honked off and don't be a Steve cup, okay? I know this gets hard. I know there's a lot going on. I know there's people yelling. I know there are people lining up. I know they're presenting another message. I know they're proclaiming another truth. I know it feels like we're losing, but that is no excuse for three out of four people to sit down and be quiet and just watch it all happen live time. We don't need one out of four. We need four out of four Christians who, who know, who believe, and who can clearly explain the word of God. Amen, church? All right, we're winning, we're winning the war. We're, we're witnesses who testify. We're, we're men and women who are in the word and we continue to share the word over and over again. Uh, number four, we worship. Say that with me. We worship. How are you gonna win the war? By being a woman or a man who is constantly actively engaged in worship with others, making much of the one true God. All right, the apostle John, remember he's the one speaking right here in Revelation 20, verse four. Look down again if you're there. It, it, he's talking about those who had not worshiped the beast or its image. Those who had not worshiped the beast or its image. Because Satan wants our attention. And you see, when you're not in worship, when you're not engaged actively with, with other believers, you know what, you give Satan increased opportunity. You give Satan increased audience. When you're out and about willy-nilly all by yourself, that is so, that's easy pickings for him. He always looks for, for the one sheep that wanders off on its own. Satan is, is trying to get your attention and, and my attention because he'd love for us to start defecting. He'd love for us to begin walking away. He would really love for us to join his side, to worship, to give allegiance to him. That's what he would like. But he's probably not going to get a number of people to defect to his side. No, he will settle for folks who just say, you know what? I'm going to sit or I'm going to stand on the sidelines. I'm just going to be somebody in the back and, and not all the way in. And then Satan says, you know what? That's good enough for me. Satan says, you just stay to the side because you know what? You got a lot of stuff to do at home anyway. You're a busy person. You have a lot of things to do. And you know what? You deserve some time for yourself as well. So don't, don't forget to get away. Don't forget to take a break. You know what? You've done so much in the past. Just kind of ease up a little and, and kick into overdrive. Just slow down. And you know what? We give him way too much attention. And boy, that just puffs up his satanic ego. Active worship of God Almighty is key to keeping us engaged in this war for the salvation of souls that are currently apart from God. I just want to read you this one verse. 
Romans 12, 1. Just listen, when it comes to worship, true worship, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, what? Worship. You see, you can't give Satan any attention. You can't take a holiday. You can't take a day off. You can't take a break. You can't be out there by yourself. With all your heart and soul and mind and strength, present your body, present your life as a living sacrifice, right? You, you don't sacrifice part of your body. You lay your whole body down. You give your whole self to almighty God in worship. You, you want to ask the question? Here, here's a quick evaluation, right? How much time am I giving God? How much time have I given him this week in reading his word? Compare that to how much time you watch the news. How much time have I been singing God's praises this week versus how many things was I listening to on the radio or, or in, my, in my iPods, in my earbuds, right? You, you, you look at the time. Look at what you spent here. Look at what you spent there. Look at what you did there. Look at what you were part of then, right? That's the easiest evaluation. Am I really worshiping God? Am I staying engaged with the bride of Christ, the body of believers? All right, just one, one more. Number five, winning the war means guarding our Christian, number five, worldview. Say that with me, our Christian worldview. Whose world is this? right? This is my father's world, right? Who created it? Who has purpose for our lives? Whose image are we created in? Whose plan is unfolding? All of these questions and others define and determine our Christian worldview. We cannot see this world through anyone else's eyes, but through the eyes of almighty God. This is his world. So we need to understand it as he has created it. We need to see those he loves as those he so loves. We need to see and grieve for those who are lost in sin, who are doing their own thing, who are giving greater audience to Satan. Our hearts need to break for them as the heart of God breaks for him. It is not his desire that any of them should perish. We need to have a right and a proper Christian world view. But you see, our, our enemy, our enemy, he wants us to see this world through, through his eyes. He wants us to, to see this world through his standards. And so he would have us to amend what we believe. He would have us to compromise. He would have us to tolerate. And then from, from tolerating something to advocating for something. And then to, to standing for something brand new, which means you're not standing any longer for the word of God. Scripture speaks of those in, in eternity from Revelation 20, verse 4, those who had not received the beast mark on their, on their foreheads or their hands. You know what? They weren't going to be associated with him. They weren't going to give in. They were not going to compromise the word of God. They were not going to pursue tolerance for, for the idea of simply being nice and, and, and turning, their, turning their heads away from sin. They weren't going to do it. And, and you see, that's really going to make life more complicated. It is. Speaking of the beast from Revelation 20, in, in Revelation 13, 17, it gives a little more understanding. It, it says, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, right? On his forehead. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. You see, as we continue to see things in our Father's world, as we continue to have a clear and consistent Christian worldview, it's going to cost us, right? It's going to cost us. There are going to be increased restrictions. We will find ourselves pushed to the side. We will find ourselves marginalized. We will find ourselves fined. We will find our, our Christian Faith, freedoms, attacked. <laughs> Expect it. But folks, if any of that happens, let me ask you this question. Is your salvation in Christ weakened? Okay, the rest of us. Is our salvation in Christ weakened? Has God lost any of his power? 
Has God lost any of his authority? Has God lost any of those he so loves? Has Christ lost any of those for whom he shed every drop of his blood? Our view of this world and our Christian worldview must remain resolute for it is based upon the word of God and influenced by the power of his Holy Spirit and it is what guides us in battle. Church, on this Memorial Day weekend, there are some things worth fighting for. And the reality is, we're not fighting for things. We are fighting for the salvation of lives that have been created in the image of God. Let me tell you this. Jesus already died for you, and Jesus already died for me. That was a battle that he believed was worth fighting. He is not calling one out of four. He is not calling two out of four. He is calling four out of four to engage in this battle and in this war. How many of us need to find our mouths and start being a faithful witness? How many of us need to get in this book? We need to be in this word. As long as we still have the breath of life in us, today is a great day to start. Figure out what this book says. For some of us, we have to increase our worship We've been worshiping too many other things and too many other ideas and too many other places. We haven't been giving God our first, our best, and our most. And we need to guard and guide how we see this world. We need to see it through the eyes of God. Who's willing to fight? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may none of us sit this one out May none of us find our way to the sidelines. May no one here have a voice that says, I've done my part, I'm done. May no one here say, not yet, it's too soon. As long as there is time and as long as there are lives perishing, help us to be those who said, this is a battle worth fighting for the salvation of even one more soul. And Father, may the glory be yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.